Bible Treasures Topic 3 Prayer We welcome you to the Sound Doctrine Telecast. We bring you greetings in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord who is called the Word of God. Praise God for giving us another opportunity where we could come together to study God's Word with a particular reference to Sound Doctrine. We have a prayer answering God. In this series of studies, we are looking at the wrong practices in prayer. Last week we studied that we must never command God. The doctrine of commanding God based on the scripture text Isaiah 45:11 is absurd. And we pointed out last week that it is a wrong translation. And also the context of the passage does not teach that. It does not agree with the consistent teaching and practice of Christ and the apostles. The doctrine on prayer that we can ask God and we can plead before him and we can seek him and we can intercede we can never ever command him. Today we go on to the second lesson on how not to pray. Do not accuse Satan. How not to pray? Do not accuse Satan. When we talk about Satan and the demonic spirits, there are two extremes that must be avoided. One extreme is denying the very existence and hence the influence of the evil spirits. And the other extreme is that attributing all our failures to Satan. One day I was going to a bus stand. And there at the entrance of the bus station was somebody who just had covered himself with the thick blank blanket and I could find out that the person inside was actually sobbing. I lifted up the blanket and asked him why he was crying. He said, I am Satan, the Christians in that locality they do whatever they want and commit all sorts of sins and finally they throw the entire blame on me. I immediately told him, don't worry, I am going to teach them to television that they cannot accuse you for all their failures. And now turn with me to understand what I am trying to arrive at. Turn with me to the book of James, first chapter, and we will read to you verses 14 to 16. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, it brings forth death. This is the pattern. Therefore, verse 16 says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. What comes first? Our own desires. And those desires draw away us into temptation. Number two, we yield to temptation, it becomes sin. And when we persist and we dwell in that sin, ultimately it results in death. Satan can only tempt us as he tempted Jesus. Satan cannot defeat us without our cooperation. Come to the first sin of our first parents. If Satan had been solely responsible for their sin, God need not have brought upon curses on Adam and Eve, isn't it? Why should he have ever brought curses on Adam and Eve? Adam the curse of hard work and for Eve the curse of painful labor. I want to tell you something. Murderer cannot throw the blame on the spirit of murder. An adulterer cannot throw the blame on the spirit of lust. And a thief cannot throw the blame on the spirit of covetousness. One should accept moral responsibility for his own failures. That is why Jesus taught us to pray, Forgive us our sins. So that truth has to be very clearly kept in mind all the times. 
Talk about this accusing Satan. There is another thing that I want to warn you against. The wrong practice that is prevailing in so-called spiritual circles of binding Satan while praying. The Satan cannot be bound and we should not attempt to bind him. The scripture that is normally quoted to support that practice is Matthew's Gospel, 16th chapter. Verse 19, the words of Jesus to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This simply means exercising heavenly authority on the face of the earth, nothing more. This has no direct reference to Satan. Because if we say that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, the question is, is there Satan in heaven? Another text that is quoted to support this wrong practice is in verses 17 and 18 of Matthew 18th chapter. This is about the church discipline. If that indisciplined person refuses to hear the people who went to counsel him, tell it to the church. If he refuses even to listen to the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So this binding and losing was a very usual, common, judicial word in the Jewish custom. That's what was used in the context of the 16th chapter and the 18th chapter of Matthew. Matthew 16, the reference is to evangelism. Jesus was asking the disciples, who do people say that I am? Peter came up with a divine revelation. Christ, the son of the living God. And immediately Jesus said, I am giving you the keys. You can open up the church and open up the doors into the kingdom for Gentiles and Jews alike. So you can exercise heavenly authority on earth. When you come to the 18th chapter, it is not for evangelism of outsiders, but it is the church discipline for the insiders. When there is a regular indiscipline and uh, misbehavior, you can say either I forgive him or you condemn him. Whatever you say as a church, that will be endorsed by heaven. Beloved, we can cast out the devil and we can refuse to give place to the devil. We can resist the devil. We can rebuke the devil. We can watch against the devil. We can be vigilant and stay alert, but you cannot arrest the devil. Beloved, do not cross the biblical boundaries. God's will that the devil must freely roam about on the face of the earth. So many times Jesus had encountered with Satan. At the maximum what he said was, get behind me Satan, that's all. Now the time when Satan will be bound is not now, but it is during millennium. Turn with me to the book of Revelation, 20th chapter. Verse 3, verse 6. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set the seal upon him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But even after those things, he must be released for a little while. Beloved, if you bind Satan today, you cannot cast him. You have to only carry him away. So in prayer, we address God. We don't address Satan. Now when Jesus was going through that hour and power of darkness in his agony of death in the garden of Gethsemane, how did Jesus respond? What did he do? 
He simply resorted to reverential fear unto his father. In a sense, on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ has already bound the strong man. Turn with me to the book of Colossians, second chapter. We will read to you the 15th words. Having disarmed the principalities and powers, he made a spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. A strong man was bound on the cross in this sense of defeating him or disarming him on the cross. It is because of this victory, today we are able to plunder or we are able to release his captives and bring them into the kingdom of God. Don't try to banish Satan also. He must be here. God wants the devil to be here. And don't try to burn Satan also. That is not your job. Turn with me when that will be done. Second Thessalonians, second chapter, eighth verse. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. There was no need for Satan today on the face of the earth. God would have fried Satan years and years ago. So don't try to bind Satan. Don't try to banish him. Do not try to burn him. Don't ever blaspheme or curse him out. Michael is an archangel. But you know how he addressed Satan? Turn with me in the book of Jude. And I'll read to you verses 8 to 10. They are dreamers, they defile the flesh, they reject authority and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, he dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but simply said, The Lord rebuke you. Even when the archangel does like that, beware, don't ever cross the limits and get into unnecessary trouble. Sometimes people quote Daniel's prayer as uh, their own illustration. Daniel was praying. From the first day when he started to pray, his prayer was heard up in heaven. The answer to his prayer was delayed. What did he do? He did not address the uh, king of Persia. He simply kept on praying and waiting in the presence of God. God dealt with the king of Persia through an angel. Daniel did not cry aloud and say, Oh, you king of Persia, come down. Just give way for the answer to my prayer. Just reach me. That's not how he responded. He kept on praying unto God. Beloved, we need to always go by the biblical pattern. Be always God conscious in prayer. Don't be devil conscious in your prayer. That is not the right way of praying. Now we have the throne of grace open for us. Think of the throne of grace and the king that sits there on our behalf. Think about the blood of Jesus Christ. Meditate on the merits of the blood of Jesus Christ. And the heavenly advocate that we have seated on the right hand of God the Father. Think and meditate about him. In the name of spirituality, many times the devil subtly distracts us from the main course of biblical teaching and we do not know that we are deceived. It's necessary that we are spiritual, but it is even more important that we stay scriptural. When we come to God in prayer, do not accuse Satan. Do not burn or bind Satan. Do not blaspheme him. None of our job. We have a God in heaven. We have Jesus our advocate seated on the right hand of God the Father. And the throne of grace that way into the holiest is open for us. Blood of Jesus Christ is sprinkled for us. And with a clear conscience we can approach God with all confidence. 
And the greatest confession that can be in our mouths is what Apostle John said in his first epistle, fourth chapter, fourth words. He who is in you is greater than he who is in this world. How not to pray? Do not accuse Satan. Praise God for these precious lessons we have so clearly been taught in God's holy word. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that the way into the holiest to the throne of grace is open for us. Thank you Lord for the blood of Jesus Christ that has been sprinkled upon us that our conscience is clear and we can come to you with all confidence without a spirit of condemnation. Thank you, O God, that we have Jesus Christ, the Advocate, on our behalf, seated on your right hand. Help us, O God, to always realize that He who is in us, and you who are in us, is greater than He who is in this world. Help us, O God, to maintain this God consciousness throughout in our prayer exercise. We give you all glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.